Let's bring in Rashir Sharma, Rockefeller International Chairman. He's out with a new piece in the FT titled, Boomi Talk About the Chinese Economy is a Charade. Uh, Rashir, great to have you back on the show. One of the things you write in this column is that there's never been a bigger disconnect in your experience between some of the rosier investment views or investment bank views on China and the dim reality on the ground. Why is that? What are you seeing? Well, I think we're all feeling it as investors that if you look at Chinese stocks, they're down 15 percent from the highs they hit this year. Some of the more consumer oriented stocks are down 25 percent. And I know people will say that the stock market is not always the economy. But if you really look at the historical relationship, what we find is that if the Chinese economy was indeed growing at even 5 percent, which is the official growth target, and you've got Wall Street investment banks talking about 5, 6 percent economic growth, then in the first quarter of this year, we should have seen corporate revenues of Chinese companies increase by about 8 percent or so. Instead, what the results showed was that the revenues of Chinese companies grew by one and a half percent. That's a huge disconnect. And I think that that's what we are finding in commentary after commentary from Chinese companies, which is that they're just not showing the kind of revenue or profit growth that would be in sync with an economy that is being described by some Wall Street economists as feeling boomy based on the macro data mm -hmm. that the government is releasing there. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can say you can point to copper prices, too, which are at a five month plus low right now, as we have seen this choppiness to this reopening in that country. How much of this is domestically fueled the weakness in this reopening and what it's doing to economic growth in China? And how much of it is geopolitically fueled, given this disentangling, uh, at least to a certain extent, between the U.S. and China, where things like trade are concerned? I think that the story is mainly domestic, which is that the Chinese economy uh, is really facing many structural headwinds. The two most prominent of those are demographics and debt. As we well know, this is the first year now that the Chinese population is actually shrinking. The labor force has been declining for a while. There is no country in economic history that has grown rapidly with a shrinking labor force. It's just never happened. So, um, in fact, our research shows that no economy has grown about 2 percent when the labor force has been shrinking. So that's exhibit A. The second point has to do with debt. And this is where I think that all these expectations that the Chinese economy will uh, grow rapidly and there'll be a lot of stimulus that the government will do. I think the Chinese government knows that it is heavily indebted, that its local governments are running out of cash, and therefore it's been quite reluctant to roll out any big stimulus, even through the pandemic. And I think that both those factors are combining to depress economic growth. So therefore, I estimate that the potential growth rate of the Chinese economy, which is the long-term underlying growth rate from this point, is closer to 2.5% based on the trends of debt and demographics. And mm. the bolder prediction that I've made late last year is I don't think the Chinese economy ever, uh, or at least in our lifetime, overtakes the U.S. economy because the trend growth rate has moved so much lower and it is still a third smaller than the U.S. economy as per the official data. Interesting, Rishir. So, so give me, give us the market implications when you've got the U.S. economy slowing down and questions about with the U.S. consumer taking on so much debt, if the consumer might be getting tapped out. And then what you, you say is happening in China and Kind of include in that, how much of this is about the Chinese consumer tilting towards services away from products as well? Because European luxury is getting some benefit from the reopening, if not as much as some hoped. Yeah, so that's co correct. That, you know, the Chinese still have spending power and they're spending on the, very, uh, on the very luxurious things. But I think luxury in general is doing well. And we know that in the U.S. or other places, you know, with stories about airlines expanding their first-class cabins and hotels charging all sorts of exorbitant rates at the luxury properties. But I think that the broader story here is that uh, the Chinese consumer, by some metrics that I quote in the article, is three times more indebted than the U.S. consumer. If you just look at uh, the debt burden as a share of their disposable income. So uh, both the Chinese uh, consumer and the government there is quite heavily indebted, even compared to the United States, where you point out that the consumer is slowing down a bit, but the consumer finances in the U.S. are in a better shape 
than the Chinese、yeah. uh, consumer finances.